Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Monday, January 15th, 2024. Larry Johnson joins us now. Larry, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, is Israel its own worst uh, enemy? Uh, is the United States boxed in a corner? Is the United States the unindicted co-conspirator at the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague. But before we do, uh, can you tell us about Gonzalo Lira, a person whose work many of us admired, an American citizen whom the American government and the uh, Ukraine government uh, permitted to die a horrible death in a Ukraine prison? Yeah, Gonzalo was uh, a sort of a internet raconteur. Uh, he had the gift to be able to sit down talk about a variety of subjects but over well, i came to know him when he was talking about ukraine and, and you know judge that uh, getting in front of a camera and being able to talk and keep people entertained and interested is, is a difficult thing to do you've got that down pat and you know, gonzalo lira did too uh, he had a unique talent and sort of a, a, a mischievous curiosity and he was not afa afraid to tackle uh, icons and other uh, narratives that were floating about. He was, I, I stumbled across him in like two months into the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine. And he was talking about the, this is when the ghost of Kiev was rampant, the, you know, the fighter pilot that shot down six Russian jets, turned out it was from a video game, uh, all the Russian tanks that were being destroyed, but it turns out those were intelligence operations staged in part by the United States with the help of uh, some American citizens. And, and Gonzalo was great at calling those out. So he was, a, he was a real tough critic of the Biden administration, of U.S. policy towards Ukraine. He was critical of the Ukrainian government. But at no point did he do anything that would have jeopardized the security or the national interest of you where, where did where did he live and work larry well he was he, he'd, he'd been traveling around the world he moved to ukraine got married uh, or at least it was in a relationship with a woman that had two children he had a son that was seven years old a daughter that was 10 years old and uh he broadcast from uh his condominium in, in an apartment building at no time did he ever show any photographs the, the, could it, any of the outside of the horizon of the city that could have been used. And, and so uh, he was, he'd been arrested in, uh, twice. And uh, on the second arrest, he was in for, you know, uh, three or four months. He got out in July of end of middle. Uh, no, I take it back. It was August. And when he got out, he would decided he was going to flee uh, to Hungary. He called me uh, late one night and I was, the, the phone was turned off. I'd gone to bed and I didn't get the call, but he was calling, asking to talk about his situation to figure out what to do. Uh, the next thing I knew was like a, a day or two later, a video appeared on YouTube of him describing his, what had happened to him in prison, that he had been beaten. He'd been extorted uh, to the tune of about $70,000. Uh, that he wasn't receiving proper uh, medical care. Uh, you know, it was a very difficult situation. And his crime, that he talked on a podcast and talked about the situation in Ukraine and was especially critical of Joe Biden and Victoria Newland and others. Mm. And he, so he came down, to the, uh, he tried to get across the border to Hungary. Uh, he, was, he didn't make it. He was uh, taken back to prison. And, you know, at no time, did the United States government intervene in any significant way? Was he an American citizen? Yes, he was born in America. To Chile. His parents were Chileans. You could call him an anchor baby. Uh, but uh, uh, he was born in America. He was also, uh, uh, he spent some time in Chile. Uh, he was a conservative. He came in for a lot of criticism because he had been more uh, a supporter of the Pinochet government. Uh, the left always got exercised over that because they saw Pinochet as uh, having, over, you know, dethroned their their favorite Allende. So, you know, he 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 was could be politically controversial, but you know, you know, fundamentally, he was a kind man. He he was not a 
he was not a malicious type and he he did, had a great did a great job of bringing people onto the internet like you where they they would talk and they get a chance to have an exchange and and explore issues and and so he'll be missed uh, greatly. And, and what caused his death? Just a uh, deterioration <laughs> of health. No, the report is that he, he he came down with pneumonia, so he was not being he was not being kept in a heated cell. Uh, and then he he had had some prior health issues, but uh, the combination of the pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and the lack of adequate medical care, and frankly, the failure of the Biden administration to intervene in any significant way. It's too bad he wasn't a, a black lesbian basketball player. They would have given a given a damn, but he well, wasn't. Well, I know that a lot of uh, our viewers and your viewers and your uh, commenters uh, lament his uh, passing. I never met him. We tried to get him on the show a few times, but obviously uh, he was uh, not able uh, to do so. He will be sorely missed. Uh, it's uh, it's terrible. Before yeah. we segue into Israel and just to put a little smile on our faces, I want to show you a clip of somebody you and I know well uh, from um, North Carolina just over the weekend. That are dead, okay? That are dead. And you, you're asking me to get out because you don't want this candidate to address the question. He's chicken to address the question. And what does he do? He repeats, repeats, Israel lobby, Israel lobby. Come to the right, please. <laughs> That's Ray being yanked out of a speech given by Bobby Kennedy. Ray stood up in the middle of the speech and said, I worked for your uncle. He knew the truth, and you don't. Boom, they yank him out. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, Ray, man, he's fearless. He, he, is, just, he, is. <laughs> he did say he was expecting uh, much rougher, rougher treatment, but Joe Biden refuses to allow the Secret Service to protect Bobby Jr., so Ray was escorted out by Bobby's PR people, not by professional law enforcement. Yeah, no, that that, that was at least smart on Kennedy's part. Kennedy, the RFK's uh, stance uh, with respect to what's going on in Gaza is is it, it it's insane. It's it's really it, it dishonors him. It, it it's does. not a it's not an honest uh, assessment. It, it does, and he went from one end to the other. I mean, uh, uh, before October. Uh, or at October 7th, he was on the right side, but the donor class got to him. Yeah. Um, is Israel its own worst enemy? Oh, yeah. They, they've they lived in this uh, protected environment where the United States shelters them. You know, they can do anything. They can kill as many journalists as they want. They can kill as many children as they want. And and then they, they hold up the the Holocaust, the Nazis tried to slaughter us, so that justifies everything else. And uh, you, know, you know, it's it's wearing really thin now because they want they try to describe what happened on October seventh as a Holocaust that Hamas was trying to exterminate Jews. Absolutely not. That's a damnable lie. The because if if that's what was what they were trying to do, they would have done it, but they didn't. Instead, they were trying to take hostages. And a significant, if not a majority, of the deaths among the Israelis that day were caused by Israel itself. His untrained, unprofessional military was indiscriminately shooting at vehicles and at gatherings and at houses by their own admissions. You know, we've got we've got the actual video evidence of it. And they were killing the Israelis. And yet they come out and they say, oh, this was... Uh, this was the Holocaust against Hamas. And so let's just do basic math. Let's assume that every one of those 1,200 people that died that day were killed by Hamas. That justifies Israel killing now almost 30,000 people, men, not the majority of it. It's women and children that are the majority of those that are dying. And Israel insists that, oh, no, we, we're, we're acting in a professional manner. We're, we're giving the citizens warning. Yeah, what they do is they, they warn people to go to a particular area, and then they shell that area when they get there. 
just like a hunter putting out a salt lick to attract a deer so he can shoot the deer. Uh, they, they bomb hospitals. They bomb UN centers. This, this is criminal on a scale that really we haven't seen since the Nazis, what they did to the citizens of particularly Eastern Europe. There's and, a female Irish uh, a barrister with an unpronounceable name uh, who made a terrific uh, argument in behalf of uh, <clears throat> South Africa at the um, uh, International Court of Justice um, on Thursday. And she pointed out that uh, Israel is using so-called dumb bombs, bombs that intentionally uh, spread their destruction, and they're bombing them in such a sequence that there is literally no escape. They could be using smart bombs, but instead they're using these 2,000-pound dumb bombs that just destroy everything in sight with a huge right. radius, right. and then the next radius... Uh, over, overlaps the previous one. So it's right. almost like the effect of carpet bombing Dresden at the end of uh, uh, of World War II. Uh, and she did make uh, she did make a great argument. Um, I don't know if you know this. Alistair uh, Crook, our mutual friend and colleague, pointed out uh, that in Western Europe, you were unable to watch the South African uh, lawyers you could only watch the Israeli lawyers. The only way you uh, could watch the South African lawyers was to go to Al Jazeera. Yeah, that's shocking. Uh, well, you know, uh, it's becoming a fascist uh, continent, not just a state. It is well, we, to... we, we, we couldn't watch it here unless we went to Al Jazeera. John Mearsheimer, who was watched every minute of every proceeding before this court on this issue, uh, told Chris, uh, you got to go to uh, Al Jazeera because nobody in the U.S. or the West uh, is covering it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. They, nobody, they went... nobody is speaking out uh, against <clears throat> this except South Africa. Yeah. Well, and then Israel turns around and calls South Africa terrorists as well. <laughs> you know, and anybody that points out the uncomfortable fact that Israel is killing women and children, and uh, you know the they are talking like a bunch of slimy lawyers. The lawyers who will, uh, they'll, they'll come up with uh, some word defense that ignores the issue. You know, for, for example, one of the Israeli spokesmen is out saying that when Netanyahu was using the reference of Amalek, which is uh, Old Testament uh, people that were ordered, that God supposedly ordered uh, Israel to slaughter all of them, not just some, all. That that all that oh Netanyahu yeah he said that but he just he he was just referring to Hamas he's not referring we're not at war with the Palestinian people meanwhile they're stacking the bodies of babies toddlers women teenagers I mean it's sick I mean I the, the amount of what's being shown is I, I I've gotten more angry with each passing week over it it's it's really it is an outrage and the world is sitting by saying nothing largely, except for people like South Africa and Yemen. You know, the so-called civilized countries are allowing this to go on. It would stop in a minute with the United States told Israel, we're not sending you another bomb. You know, because the dumb bombs you're talking about are bombs that they, they can't direct. They drop them and gravity decides where it's going to go. The smart bomb is where you can, uh, you can have it guided in to hit a particular location, a pinpoint. But this is uh, they're, they're just about, they want to destroy and level Gaza to drive out the Palestinians, force them from that area so that the Israeli citizens can move in and take over. Chris, let's play uh, the first minute or so of <coughs> Professor Malcolm Shaw, first minute or so of Sat, uh, Sat II. This is the uh, lead Israeli lawyer. He happens to be a British barrister. And then let's play the edited version of the uh, Irish female uh, barrister making the uh, case for South Africa. South Africa casts its net widely. In its application, it uses the word context many times. In particular, it declares that it is important to place the acts of genocide in the broader context of Israel's conduct towards the Palestinians during its 75-year-long apartheid. Leaving aside the outrageous nature of that statement, 
Why stop at 75 years? Why not refer to 1922 and the approval by the Council of the League of Nations of the British Mandate? Or 1917, the proclamation of the Balfour Declaration? Without the truth, there is an urgent need for provisional measures to protect Palestinians in Gaza from the irreparable prejudice caused by Israel's violations of the Genocide Convention. For children in particular, the last 12 weeks have been traumatic. No food, no water, no school, nothing but the terrifying sounds of war day in and day out. Gaza has simply become uninhabitable. Its people are witnessing daily threats to their very existence, while the world watches on. Turning to the court's case law, as the court has recently reaffirmed, and I quote, the condition of urgency is met when acts susceptible of causing irreparable prejudice can occur at any moment before the court makes a final decision on the case, end quote. That is precisely the situation here. Any of those matters to which I have referred can and are occurring at any moment. United Nations Security Council resolutions demanding, quote, the immediate, safe, unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance at scale throughout Gaza and full, rapid, safe and unhindered humanitarian access, end quote, remain unimplemented. United Nations General Assembly resolutions calling for a humanitarian ceasefire have been ignored. The situation could not be more urgent. Since these proceedings were initiated on the 29th of December 2023 alone, an estimated over 1,703 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza and over 3,252 injured. As to the criterion of irreparable prejudice, for decades now, the court has repeatedly found it to be satisfied in situations where serious risks arise to human life or to other fundamental rights. In Qatar, United Arab Emirates, the court considered provisional measures to be justified, having regard to the risk of irreparable prejudice deriving from factors such as people being forced to leave their places of residence, without the possibility of return, the psychological distress of temporary or potentially ongoing separation from their families, and the harm associated with students being prevented from taking their exams. If provisional measures were justified there, how could they not be in Gaza? Yeah. Well, she makes a very compelling argument. Is the United States of America the unindicted co-conspirator? Yeah, we're, we're, the, we're the enabler. Israel would not have the ability to do any of this without the United States. We're, for, we're facilitating the crime. And, it's, you know, frank, frankly, it's not the first time we've facilitated international crime. But, but in this case, it, it's particularly egregious because uh, these, the, the women and children that are being killed, you know, they're not out throwing rocks. They're not posing any direct threat to anybody in Israel. Uh, the attack that was carried out by Hamas was carried out by men. And it wasn't carried out just on the spur of the moment because, oh, we hate, we hate Israelis, we hate Jews. You know, we're talking about 70 years of uh, pent-up anger uh, that has, you know, there, there, there's been guilt on both sides. I don't want to pretend that Israel has not faced some threats. But, but Israel had other choices. That's the point people are missing. On October 7th, let's take October 7th happened. Israel had other choices. For example, we knew at the time that Egypt and Saudi Arabia were not supporters of Hamas by any stretch. Turkey as well. All Israel had to do was to go to Turkey, to Egypt, and to Saudi Arabia quietly, diplomatically, enlist their support in going after cutting off the funds to Hamas and for asking that the people who carried those attacks out be turned over, and that the hostage is released. There was a diplomatic way that this could have been done. It could have been solved without all this death and destruction. And Israel would have maintained the high road. But instead, it, it climbed right down into the mud and decided that it would be dirtier 
more filthy than anything that Hamas did. You probably didn't see this on the news either. This is um, not the Middle East. This is Washington, D.C. on Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, yeah crowd started, estimates as large as, uh, as 200,000. Yeah, there's, it, it's starting to grow in the United States. The, 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 the lock that the Israeli lobby had through APAC on the U.S. Congress and on the American uh, political uh, scene it, it, it's it's eroding. If if you're under 40 years of age, you're more likely to be a supporter uh, of the the Palestinian cause, not the Israeli cause. It, this the the the, ra the rabid support for Israel is particularly strong in people. You know, they're over the age of 60. You know, my age. Why is Joe Biden uh, bombing Yemen? <laughs> and, what, uh, and what if anything? Yeah. I already know the answer. That's why I'm smiling. What, if anything, are they accomplishing? Well, so, well, the Yemenis said, okay, we're going to shut down the Red Sea. And they've, they've effectively done that. Any, any ship that's going to Israel to or from, uh, they vowed to attack and have been attacking them. In fact, they just attacked another one today. And, and so, the, yes, they're inter, under international law, the Yemenis are interfering with, at least the West can legally argue, that the Yemenis interfering with the right of uh, navigation. And so the United States is going to take measures to open it up. Well, dropping bombs on Yemen, that, you know, the phrase, oh, we're going to bomb them into the Stone Age. How do you bomb someone in the Stone Age who's already living in the Stone Age, okay? You're not, you're not going to be able to damage them. Uh, the United States has been bombing parts of Yemen. It goes back uh, almost nine years. And to what effect? Well, the, the Houthis actually ended up winning the war that uh, we were fighting. We were helping the Saudis fight against them. So they're accustomed to taking a beating. The United States can continue to launch bombing attacks. And the problem is the missiles, the rockets, the systems that are used to attack these ships, they're mobile. This is, and it's not, we're not talking one or two. We're, we're really talking thousands. And so the Yemenis can get them out there and have them running around uh, and, and you're trying to find the right one to hit. Um, so it, it is, it, it's, it's a futile effort on the part of the United States. And then what it, what it is exposing is that the aircraft carrier with its two accompanying destroyers that are there, or the Marine, the Bataan, the amphibious ship, these destroyers have what are called vertical launch systems. And they, they've got a, they're like uh, canisters that sit in the deck, shoot the missiles up. And usually for every incoming missile, you're going to fire two missiles at it. Well, they don't have an unlimited supply. So after they fire like 80 of their missiles, they have to then go back to a port to have that system reloaded because they can't reload it at sea. We got rid of the ships that could do that uh, 30, 40 years ago. And so what, what the United States is engaged in is a futile operation because they're not going to be able through military force, through dropping bombs, killing Yemenis, that, that that will get Yemen to go, oh, we better stop this because the United States is going to attack us. They don't care. They literally do not care. They are convinced that they're on the right, that what is happening in Israel, what Israel's doing to the Palestinians is a violation of international law. And so they're fighting on behalf of the Palestinians. Isn't it a violation of international law? For the United States to attack another member of the UN? Well, yeah, not just that, but th think about this, Judge. The, the use of military force overseas against terrorist targets was done under the authorization to, uh, for the use of military force, AUMF, right. uh, an order that came out in 2001. I mean, I know the guy that was involved with actually drafting that. So by 2002, that AUMF authority was used and Congress blessed it, said, OK, yeah, you're good. You can now go after those terrorists. Well, Yemen is not identified as a terrorist state. Actually, Donald Trump put them on the terrorist list and then Joe Biden came in and took them off. So they're no longer can be covered by AUMF. So here is the United States, the president carrying out military operations overseas without the consent of Congress. Now, people will say, well, under exigent circumstances, you have to do that. And this is where Biden's so stupid. Why do you want Congress to approve it and give you the green light? 
Because when things go in the toilet, if it goes sour, if there's an aircraft carrier that's sunk and we've got 4,000 dead sailors, if Congress approved it, it's not just Joe Biden and his team of idiots that caused this. He's right. got to say, hey, Congress told me to do it. Right, so right. he doesn't even understand the concept of political cover. And, and ditto for these people like Lindsey Graham calling to attack Iran. Okay, if you want to attack Iran, go to Congress, get permission. Let's see how that works out. They don't want to do that. They want to attack Iran, start a war, and then force Congress to come along. And, you know, that that's a recipe for political disaster in the United States. Here is... Um... Uh, Admiral Kirby doing his one of his Baghdad Bob uh, routines. Cut five, Chris, on uh, Face the Nation uh, yesterday, uh, defending these uh, strikes on the Houthis. Does the U.S. assess that these coalition strikes will deter the Houthis, or are you bracing for retaliation and an open-ended conflict? I think it'd be Pollyannish for us to think that there couldn't or may not be some sort of retaliatory strike by the Houthis. We're watching this very, very closely. We've, take the, we've taken the requisite uh, necessary precautions in the region to make sure we're ready for that if that should occur. These strikes were meant to disrupt and disgrade, degrade their ability to conduct these strikes. Um, and so we think that we had good effect on that. We're still assessing uh, the battle damage assessment of those strikes, but we think we had good effect. Uh, we'll see what happens. The, the Houthis have a choice to make here now, Margaret, uh, and the right choice is to stop these reckless attacks. And no matter what they say, this is not about uh, punishing Israel. I mean, one of the ships they took a shot at yesterday was Panamanian flag that it was taking Russian oil. It had nothing to do with Israel. So it, it may be an open-ended conflict. We don't know if deterrence has been established. Nobody wants a conflict with the Houthis. We're not looking for a conflict with Yemen here. We're trying to get these attacks to stop. You know, he's a retired admiral. He should know especially that about which, uh, that about which he speaks. And apparently he doesn't, Larry. Yeah. Well, you know, the other, the other element, to, there's a financial element here. Each one of those missiles, the, the defense missile, air defense missiles that those ships fire, <laughs> they cost between one and two million dollars a pop. Wow. And so it's not like the United States is sitting on this uh, completely full warehouse where we've got just an overabundance. It's, you know, the, the missiles are pouring out the sides. We've got too many, so let's uh, use them up. No. We can't, we can't even produce enough every year to sustain this kind of operation over, say, a six-month period. So what's going to happen is the, the, the Yemenis, they're going to launch uh, a $10,000 drone. They could can, they can maybe swarm a ship with uh, 100 $10,000 drones. And then the United States is going to have to fire, if, they, if they're swarming us with 100, we're going to have to fire 200 missiles at the tune of let's let's just go with a million dollars a pop. Well, right there, two hundred million dollars, <laughs> quarter of a billion. So How Kirby, can you sustain that? You Kirby can't. Claim, Kirby claims we're degrading the Houthis. We're degrading we're ourselves. Absolutely, in a that's PR that's what's war, going on. In a PR way and in a military way, we're degrading yeah. ourselves. Well, and and one of the other things that's happened is that one of the reasons they returned the ships uh, that that original uh, I think it was the Gerald R. Ford that was there, they ordered it back to port is because it, the crew is it's undermanned, understaffed. Uh, so, so they can't really do everything that they need to do at sea and sustain themselves out there. So, you know, this notion that the United States is the, the greatest superpower in the world and that we can, we're invincible, boy, we got some feet of clay. And what's dangerous is when our political leaders refuse to acknowledge that. And, and they, they maintain this pretense that all we got to do is just launch some bombing strikes and some cruise missiles. Boy, that'll show these people. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna stop Yemen. I mean, candidly, the only way that, that would you would stop Yemen is would require an actual invasion of the United States, a ground invasion of Yemen, and a full-scale war to destroy the, the military. And we'd be talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of casualties on the part of the United States, not just to mention what would happen to the Yemenis. And we're not, we can't do that. We don't have the financial resources to do it. We're already $34 trillion in debt.
one of our viewers writes, we don't have leaders, we just have warmongers. Well, because old, old Joe wants to run for re-election <laughs> as a wartime a president, doesn't care who dies uh, in the prospect of that happening. Larry, it's a pleasure, uh, my dear friend. Uh, we we made uh, McGovern promise not to give you a heads up that we were going to run that. <laughs> he did. Uh, he did. Uh, he he. <laughs> I hadn't even heard about that. Yeah, <laughs> so. we're we're looking for more. Chris thinks he can find a clip of of Ray actually shaking his fist oh. at Bobby and the look on Bobby's face. We'll get it. I'd love that. All right, we'll that. see you. We'll see you Friday for the roundtable. Thank you very much, Larry. All the best. Thanks, Judge. Have a great week. You too. Coming up uh, later today, not 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 very much later at one thirty this afternoon Eastern, Colonel Douglas McGregor. At 2.45 this afternoon, Eastern, Bill O'Reilly. Yes, that Bill O'Reilly. And at 4 o'clock Eastern, Professor John Mearsheimer, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.